We're way out west in search of more quilt shops, and I've got my quilting with me. Stay tuned for lap quilting. You quilt or your life. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine a more clever object? Warms the body, ignites the mind. A child sleeps under mother's creation, together forever. The art of the heart and design of the mind puts you to bed one day at a time. The art of the heart and design For a quilter, mention Phoenix, Arizona, and the Quilted Apple Shop comes to mind. Now, do they grow apples in Arizona? Well, I was hoping they grew cotton for quilts. It's a state-of-the-art shop with the latest for the crafty quilter. From fabric, to classes, to notions, to books, why, it's all here. Meet the ladies who put it all together, Lorene Cinema and Val Sparks. It's a pleasure to be in sunny Arizona. Laureen Cinema. It's wonderful to have you here. And Val Sparks, you have a unique situation within the store. Tell us about that. Well, Laureen and I are partners in the Quilted Apple Bernina, which is the Bernina dealership, and it's really neat to be part of the larger quilt shop because I think it just gives us a wonderful environment to be in. Good exposure for the sewing machines, and uh, you oh, have a is. special demonstration set up for us in a few minutes. We look forward to seeing that. Okay, we'll see you later. Thank you, Val. Lorene, the minute we walked into the store, we saw a unique display of fabric. It's different. It, it's, uh, tell us about it and why. Well, we call it our circle of fabric because you can just walk through and, and see every fabric. We display it uh, horizontally because when we first opened our shop years ago, it was in a little barn with uh, five shelves. We could put 13 bolts of fabric oh. on, and, that, and it was like a bookcase, and they were, on, they were horizontally uh, laid and so that's how we started and, and then we just kept building because we like the look of it and I've tried to analyze the reason and I think our eye does not move up and down but moves across and so we're able to see all of the fabric. Give us a rundown of the store. Describe every nook and cranny here. Well we have uh, the books and, and we have kind of a triangular setup for the books so that you can go on one side and see books and then on the other side um, we also have a nice area for patterns um, and the samples. All throughout the shop, the samples are hanging and in the classroom, they're hanging. We probably have more classes than many shops do, so there are a lot of very fine uh, samples. Um, I consider that the finer your sample is, the finer your customer or your student will do. It sets some high goals I for them. I think it does, yes. and I believe in that. Now you have a, a notion area where you've got your stencils and all the template material and some special thread. Is silk thread important? It is to our shop because I teach applique. That's my forte and I have a lot of applique classes and hand applique and we love silk thread for hand Why? applique. It, um, you don't need as many colors. However, it's a costly uh, spool of thread. It's about five dollars. But you don't need as many colors. And it embeds, as you're taking your stitches, that silk just kind of embeds into the cotton and you can't see the stitches it, at all. It disappears. It disappears. Oh, that's a good tip it to is know. It is a good thing. Yes. Twenty-two years, Lorraine, yes. you have been in this business and your latest opportunity, uh, tell us about that. Oh, it's very exciting, number one. It's a line of fabric with South Seas. Uh, one of their people came over to me in my booth at market and asked what I, the direction I thought quilting was going to go. And I, of course, being an applicator, and I had taught a lot of uh, Baltimore, and I was teaching it again. It had come around again, and I said, well, I really feel it's going to be this applique, and fine hand applique. Then uh, we talked some more, and she said, well, um, what about uh, you doing a line of fabric and I just said okay mm -hmm. because you don't want to miss an opportunity it's reproduction many of the uh, of the patterns are taken or the designs are taken from an antique quilt well the colors are exciting That's I think cool. anytime you put red and green together and that hint and of that cheddar yes, and a little yes. blue it's quite an array of books that you've published uh, I know you're very proud of that 
from there you went to patterns okay. so you sell individual patterns too but they all now seem to uh, be featured with red work tell me about your interest in this it um, in all of my books I had a little something that was red work just because I enjoyed it and it's a different direction to go then I picked up some antique things the quilts that you see mm -hmm. and this piece it's just phenomenal from a, a farm in Iowa mm -hmm. they um, I believe that what they did was put this over the lunch table prior to the men coming in for lunch. It was all set and ready to go. Then, so when I got it, rather than just keep it as red work, I thought, well, I'll combine a little red work and applique, and mm -hmm. it became the piece that uh, we call Red Work Farm. Mm -hmm. Describe these other uh, big quilts that you have in red work. Are these uh, historical quilts? They've, they've been around? Oh, uh, yes. The Irish chain one? And the, around 1920, probably, 1898 to about the 1930s, red work was big time. So it was a way um, for a quilter to combine embroidery work and her patchwork skills. It, it was, except that I do believe when it came from Europe, it went to the children. It seems so, line drawings were easy for children yes. to do. And now the blue and white one. This quilt is especially nice. The, the blocks are on point. But if you notice, you kind of have to turn your head because they're penny squares that they have simply turned on point even though they were straight. Oh. It's Another thing, some people hold their thread up. You can hold it up or you can hold it down. I prefer to hold it down. I like the look of that. Makes a nice. And, and if you have, if you do a smaller stitch, you're going to have a prettier line of thread. If, you're thre if your stitch is too long, you end up with um, loops, kind of. And it's more difficult to go around corners, too. Absolutely. Now, tell me how it all begins. For instance, uh, you, your book on red work, you have mm -hmm. your design all drawn. Then if you choose your piece of background fabric and place it over the top, and we draw ours on with a red Pigma pen, and as you're stitching, it just covers that line, where sometimes you use a pencil, it's a fatter line, and you're not going mm -hmm. to have it all covered. Mm -hmm. So that's what we use. And if you're doing blue work, you The use blue pen. Exactly. Pretty clever. Mm -hmm. so. It's really fun. I think the reason it's gotten so uh, uh, maybe popular is because, number one, a lot of us remember our grandmothers mm -hmm. doing it. Secondly, you can pick this up and take it anywhere. Right angles always puzzle me. How do you do that if you were going Let's to... say, I'll come over here. All right, sneak a little bit yeah. and show me how you do that. Because I never know where to put the needle. Let's see, I've done that backwards. Oh no, I can go this way. Turn this around. You can do a point to one of two ways. Let me do this All right. quickly. You can go up. I go almost to the point, mm -hmm. um, like here now. And then take the thread and come this way mm -hmm. into the point with the needle, taking a little overcast stitch oh. as you pull that into place. I then see. you take a little and go stitch down on there the and go down on the that. outside. Uh -huh. Oh, that really secures it. And then come up, and it gives a nice point. See? Ah. And Very nice. Come. Now you're using embroidery thread, but just yes. one strand. Uh huh. And there are certain numbers of, of uh, thread. We use DMC. Mm -hmm. 
Number 498 is the color I'm using here, and that's what most of the time that's the color that everyone sees. It's a darker in the red, it's isn't a darker it? Red. And it's I a think blue it, red. It's more appealing mm -hmm. than that bright fire red. Right. Lorreen, your red work has culminated in an interesting idea a club. Right. It's a national club, and it is only for uh, shop owners. A lot of times they're unable to really put uh, together a club. So, my friends, Betty Alderman, Cindy Taylor Oates and myself, we together put this notebook that they can purchase. In it, we have a history of red work we have, so they can share it with their students. We have um, a, a group of patterns for them. We have projects. We have the how-tos. And so they purchase this with a flat fee, and they may copy as much, many times as they wish for their club. Good idea. It's worked out well. You have so much going on in this shop, and I know a lot of ideas still going on in your head, so we wish you continued success, and thank you so much for thank letting you. us visit. Thank you very much for coming. And now we're going to sneak over and get that machine demonstration. Good plan. Val, what are we going to see today? We're going to see Claudia Donnell, who's one of our teachers here at the shop. She's going to be demonstrating the Bernina Bias Binder Attachment, and she's using it on an apron today. Okay, and uh, you're referring to these thingamabobs that used to come in all old mm -hmm. machines, and now it is an extra addition that you would buy, plus this little foot that would go with it. Yes. And uh, I'd like to know, how would I use it in the end, Claudia? You can use it on bibs and on aprons, on baby blankets, such as this polar fleece blanket. Makes a great edging on the end of it here. Um, also, you can do napkins. There's all sorts of garments you can put it on. Placemats. Mm -hmm, Placemats. It looks just wonderful. It would be used mostly on something that you would want to frequently machine wash so that it has a, a great edge, it keeps a great edge on it. Right. Not necessarily your judged quilts. Right. Now, how would you uh, begin? You would cut, uh, on this particular binder, you cut a one inch strip of bias binding and you would attach it also on the bias right here. You need to uh, make sure that when you cut your quarter inch seam, it is facing away from the entrance of the foot so that it evenly feeds through. Mm -hmm. And then I also cut a point to start and it makes it a lot easier to go in. Then you slide it in the entrance here. I use a screwdriver to that helps me uh, manipulate it through the foot and I just get a little tail started here. And then I start sewing and make sure it's going through the, the correct way. Now, because this is an apron and I have tails, I'm going to go ahead and sew just the binding by itself to, to up to my mark. I have a, a mark, a 10 inch mark up here. It's feeding through right now, so I can see it's just about where, right there. Now I want to slide my fabric in. I'll lift up my presser foot. I just put this in, and you want to make sure that the fabric is laying flat that the bias piece is in a curve like this, that this goes straight in, not partial in and not in too much so that it folds. You just want to make sure you bring it right up to uh, that inner edge. Would you ever backstitch there, Claudia, to hold you it know, in place? You don't need to. It okay. sews it down so well. All right. However, I do have my straight stitch on a little bit less than about a two. Oh, so that's good to know. It's a little, bit, know. It's smaller, a little bit tighter. And you don't really need to use uh, backstitching then. And of course, and you here, have a excuse me. You have a matching bobbin to your top yes, thread. Yes, and you would want to match this as much as possible. You notice my seam is coming through now, and you want to make sure that it lays nice and flat as it comes through. Look how nicely it's taking that curve. This just works beautiful. This is such a wonderful foot. I'm going to come right off the edge there, and I'm going to keep sewing for another ten inches because that's going to be my tie on the top of the apron. That would be all I would need. Lift it up and take it out and cut it, and it just comes out beautiful. Oh, and I know she put a little knot at the end. That's a nice way to secure right. it. And you can also fold it back on top of itself and stitch it down and then cut this, and that's how they do many times when you purchase them. But uh -huh. I also like the, I like the look of the knot. Yes. That's what a it. wonderful idea. Thank you so much. I, I think a lot of people are going to go promptly to their sewing cabinet and get out that little gizmo and use it it's and try wonderful. it. Val, thank you so much for opening up this corner for us and uh, introducing a, another technique on the sewing machine. Well, thanks for being here. Okay. Welcome back to North Carolina and our Quilt Built Studio. The quilter's alphabet letters today are W and X. W is for wadding, the European term for batting. I hope you enjoyed our show where we learned how batting is made. 
It comes in cotton and polyester and in dark and in blends. It's all there for you to use. W is whole cloth quilt. A quilt of continuous fabric with an overall quilt design without applique or patchwork. Genevieve Grundy has a wonderful example in a whole cloth quilt. X is for exercise. We've run out of ideas. Maybe don't forget to exercise or quilts are so exciting. Let us know what you think. Now we're going to take you to a wonderful interview with an interesting collector. Yard by yard, life is hard. Inch by inch, it's a cinch. In just about every workroom, in every sewing studio, why in every nook and cranny of a basement, you can find a yardstick. But would anyone collect over a hundred yardsticks? You bet. Meet May Baker from Scottsdale, Arizona. How did this all get started, this enormous collection? Well, I've always sewed or drawn, did things with yardsticks and different kinds of measuring things. One day I realized I had a yardstick from most of the places that I had lived in. So I decided it would be fun to see if I couldn't have a yardstick from every town I'd lived in. Then it was every yard, a fabric store I went to. And then people started giving me these things because they knew I liked yardsticks and rulers. And it just grew and grew. Not only has it grown, but the word has gotten around and now you're giving lectures and this has caused you to become more informed uh, about the history. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, yardsticks have been around forever. We've had lots of forms of measurements like the palm of our hand uh, from our finger to our elbow. But King Igor in England established the standard measure for a yardstick. And this accomplished um, two things. He took this ruler, this yardstick, mm -hmm. and stored it away in Windsor. That was the capital of England at that time. And people then could go and check that measurement or make duplicate that measure. And what is the oldest ruler in your collection, May? Well, it would be this little green 12-inch ruler that's from the Hartford Fire Insurance Company. It has a lot of old dates on it, and it's metal. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also a little round place here for the student to store his mm -hmm. or her pencil. Mm -hmm. And then what's this box? Well, this is a little pencil case. The fun part about this little ruler is that Glenn Snyder signed it. Uh, he's from Michigan, mm -hmm. and um, oh, he's got some little cross hatching and all kinds of things, but I think this is just fun and mm -hmm. pretty to mm -hmm. look at. Tell me about this, these two other ones that you're very interested in. Well, this in. is a little sewing um, ruler that you use for lots of things. As you pointed out earlier, it's a perfect template. Mm -hmm. uh, marking maybe pleats, buttons, mm -hmm. it's the distance of a couple of things. This is my most favorite little <laughs> ruler. It's half a foot. Mm -hmm. Yardsticks are primarily advertising devices. Mm -hmm. Uh, the majority of mine are strictly advertising. Tell me about the rest of the things on the table. Well, someone gave me the shoe measures, mm -hmm. which are just great fun to have mm -hmm. around. When we were children, we always used those, remember? For sure, yes. Yeah. The little tape measures. Mm -hmm. But we find measuring things, rulers and yardsticks everywhere. There's the brown bag. Mm -hmm. There's a calendar, a 1935 calendar from Northwestern Mutual Insurance Life Insurance Company and they made sure they had a ruler along the top edge. Then you have a lot of 12 inch rulers, quite a collection of those. We have a lot of 12 inch rulers uh, and 6 inch rulers also. Uh, some of the 6 inch rulers are the prettiest little rulers because they're usually of the, of the maple. Ah. And um, again, they're primarily advertising butter, shoes, little parrot Remember parrot shoes when you were a child? Yes. They always gave you a ruler <laughs> when you bought a pair of shoes. Well, let's, uh, let's go over and look at some of your longer yardsticks. And these are all hardware? I have more hardware store yardsticks than anything else. Mm -hmm. And my favorite is this one. Oh. But it doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> no, I'm afraid bone steel hardware and quilt corners no longer in business. Uh, things change after That's 20 right. years. That's right. We're supposed That's to right. go on with life. That's right. Well, tell me about, uh, for instance, this one. Well, that would be my youngest or newest yardstick. That's from the town of Fountain Hills, Arizona. New town, and it has a fax number. Not Next. only a telephone number, but a fax number. Next we know there'll be websites and emails. 
on yardsticks. Yeah, on yardsticks. They won't sticks. even have room for measurements anymore. Maybe not. <laughs> You're starting to put them in categories and keeping them labeled. Yeah, um, I'm trying to get that all in the computer so that when I want to pull up the yardsticks from certain states or certain kinds of stores, museums will use these to use in special exhibits at yes. times. Now, an interesting story here. Well, that's a country auction yardstick, and he stands there and pokes it on the, on the ground mm -hmm. to get the attention of the crowd, and because it's a yardstick, he can tell the crowd just how wide that little dresser is. Uh-huh. Excellent idea. What about the holes in this well, one? Well, those are spark plug uh, yardsticks, and there are 16 holes there. For 16 cylinder cars. For 16 cars. cylinder cars, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. right. Very good. Now, oh, another thing about this little yardstick is its telephone number. It's a 5-0, only two numbers. Mm -hmm. That means it was a small rural town, and you can help date yardsticks by the telephone numbers. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, the sayings are unique, and they are each, each one is different. Uh, tell me a few of these. Okay, we'll start at the bottom, the longest one. That's a long rule, by the way. That's longer than 36 inches. And it says, we have come a long ways in 53 years, and the dates are 1925 to 1978. The next one, a rule you can't beat. Trade at Ross and Salvage. Handy, helpful, hardware man. Everyone has e always heard that expression. Oh, yes, yes. And then the last one would be get a full measure of real estate and insurance services. Well, that this has been so unique and so many varieties of color, mostly the wooden mm -hmm. ones, but uh, such a fun idea. And we wish you many more yardsticks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us today. And by the way, this is the cat's meow, your yardstick <laughs> suspenders. <laughs> After seeing May Baker's collection, I bet you'll check out your own yardsticks. Our block of the day is cactus for Arizona. It's made with many rectangles, and I have a little tip of the day to give you. Of course, when you're cutting strips that will become rectangles, you'll always be standing up. And when you cut those repeated strips, sometimes you get confused with the markings on the uh, ruler. So I think it helps to take some quarter-inch masking tape and bend it back so you can remove it easily and place it at, for, for this case, an inch and a quarter cut. You might want to take some of those sticky notes and place those underneath so you can visually see those repeated cuts every time. Notice that when I put this together, I did it in three sections, A, B, and C. And when I use the grid grip, I simply coat it, A1, A2, A3, and all the way down. And you can see how it's been done in rows. Now, as far as your sewing machine setup, I hope that you're fortunate enough to have a big table. But if you take your sewing machine out and put it on your kitchen table, do indulge in one of these swivel chairs, because then you can raise and lower it, and it's important to be looking down on the needle and not to be looking up to it. So that then you also have the wonderful opportunity to have cabinets that drawers that open easily. Well, I think that's pretty neat. So you can store all your things. Now, when I'm not taping, I take this cabinet and place it on top of my other cabinet. It makes it really good for accessibility. My table is big. It has a leaf that goes down and then lifts up for when I'm really cutting and, and doing my quilts. I have a nice table for my serger and the nicest thing about my table is that I have all this leg room. I can come over here for cutting and I can come over here for sewing. Now we will see you next time on Lap Quilting. It's our last show so don't miss it. See you then. Closed captioning made possible by Omnigrid, manufacturer of the original patented black and yellow rulers and green cutting mats, and Collins, well known for notions and tools for quilt makers.
For more information about patterns and designs shown on this series, visit Georgia at www.georgiabonesteel.com. Lap quilting with Georgia Bone Steel is made possible in part by grants from Bernina, makers of sewing machines manufactured with the care of traditional Swiss workmanship. Nothing sews like a Bernina. Nothing. By Gamel Quilting Machine Company, offering four sizes of long arm hand guided machines to quilters worldwide. By Coates and Clark, America's number one name in sewing, hand knitting, and craft products. By Martingale and Company, home of That Patchwork Place, publisher of America's best loved craft and hobby books. By Hobbs Bonded Fibers, maker of heirloom premium cotton and wool batting, with a package labeling system to help quilters select the correct batting for specific projects. And by Horn of America, cabinets of the future today.